Hello, students of SEO. My name is Ryan Dolan, and I'm a digital marketing strategist with Fine Law, a Thomson Reuters business. You can get at me at, at Ryan Dolan or at the uh, LinkedIn URL on the slide. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about off-site SEO, understanding links and how they impact search. Basically, this is going to come in four parts. We're going to do a quick introduction into definitions. Uh, we're going to talk about links and how they have a direct effect on search results. Then we're going to talk about link building strategies and tactics. And finally, we're going to wrap up with a discussion of penalties, link analysis, and recovery. What is SEO? As we know, it's all about improving organic search visibility. Organic obviously means unpaid, and it's where you rank for your keywords on search engine results pages. Right? So that's a SERP right there. Um, you can see we did a Google keyword search, and the displayed uh, search results are make up what we call the SERP. So what is off-site SEO? Off-site SEO is still about trying to rank for those keywords, but the optimization takes place outside of the content and the code on your website. So there are some opportunities to kind of build your brand and web presence off-site that include inbound links or backlinks, content marketing, social media, local search, video, and other things like social bookmarking. There are some of the big brands that you know, Vimeo, Yahoo, Yelp, YouTube. I think I see a MySpace on there. Wow. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on inbound links or backlinks. So you might be asking, Professor Ryan, why exactly are we talking about this? I'm a busy college student. Why did I get out of bed? Well, the answer is that organic search is still, despite rumors to the contrary, a growing field, uh, not only on desktop, but in particular for tablet searching and especially for mobile. So since we know that the goal of SEO is to rank higher than our competitors, right? We should consider the following very carefully when we talk about why off-site SEO is important. First of all, let's talk about SERP position and click-throughs. A click-through is when somebody sees your result in a search engine rankings page, a SERP, and they click through to your site. So the first organic result in general gets between 33 and 53% of clicks. First page, between 70% and 90% of clicks. And when you talk about conversion rates, that's the rate at which site visitors become buyers, customers, or subscribers. Between 1% and 20%, depending on the niche or industry. What you basically have is that if you're a new brand without a, kind of an established mark or any sort of reputation to speak of, if you're not on page one, you're already putting yourself behind the eight ball in terms of your digital marketing strategy. It's really, really key that you do off-site optimization and you do it right. Another important factor is, and this is going to come up later when we talk about Google and what they expect, it's going to differentiate you from your competitors, and that's a good thing. To kind of get into off-site SEO, and as we discussed, we're going to talk mostly about backlinks and hyperlinks in general we got to understand what the hyperlink is. So here we got a slide with the inventor of the internet who says that, along with Merriam-Webster, an electronic link provides direct access from one distinctly marked place in a hypertext or hypermedia document to the same or different document. And basically all that's saying is what everybody already knows. When you click on a link, it takes you from one place on the internet to another. So next we're going to talk a little bit through an abbreviated history of search because you can't really understand how a link impacts search without getting a little bit of background. So early search, we're going to call this mm, the early to mid 90s. Search results were based entirely on keywords just like you have on your site now and they were picked up by the search algorithms, put into the indexes and then picked out uh, and offered as results. These are easily manipulated with keyword spam and you could add one single line of code in your website and you would rank number one. Apparently not everyone knew that about that one line of code, but that was the way it was. And the result was search engines really didn't provide great results. So these are some of the early players in that game. You'll note Yahoo's original logo there on the right. Very exciting. Middle search. I would say that middle search started in 1998 when Google came about. Search engine results were still based on the keywords on the page, but they now are also biased towards more popular or authoritative websites and web pages. And that's simply because 
more popular and authoritative websites are more popular and authoritative because they offer better answers and they offer better results to searchers. Unfortunately, a byproduct of this was the development of the link spam industry, which we'll discuss more later. But essentially, what became of the links at that point is that you could just like keywords, manipulate them very easily to rank number one. Google, MSN, DMOZ, and Ask Jeeves were some of the search engines that popped up around this time. In response to the link spam industry, we kind of moved into the era of modern search. And I would actually say that's probably the last four or five years. So keywords and site authority or popularity are still the most important factors, but search engines have become more sophisticated. And they become more sophisticated in that they can now detect spam and potential manipulation better than they could before. The consequence is, is that when you use spam or other tactics that Google feels are manipulative, you're going to get slapped with the band stick. You're going to get in trouble with Google penalties, which we'll discuss in part four. So what was left after the cataclysm of middle search is Google, Yahoo, and Bing, the big three. But make no mistake, the big dog in the room, the juggernaut, is Google. Google now controls 67.6% .6 of market share for US search. And that's from Comscore. That data is fairly accurate. But this is my personal experience. That number is way higher. So we have 92%. 80%, 87%, 85%, you get the point, right? These are really, really large numbers. By comparison, Budweiser has a market share of 8.4%. The iPhone, the ubiquitous smartphone of our age, only 41.3%. So since we know that Google is so important, we should probably talk about what they view as their mission as a search engine. And they're right from the horse's mouth. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful to provide the best, most relevant results possible to searchers. That's it in a nutshell. And they basically do that by ranking sites on how important or popular they are in addition to the other keyword factors that we've discussed previously with Professor Allison. So let's talk about authority. Now authority is being able to use your position of influence or knowledge to influence or manipulate others into doing what you want. What authority means to Google is that a site is trusted. Trusted sites tend to provide a searcher with more, more info and value. And basically, uh, we want to know how sites develop authority for the purposes of our presentation today. So how does anyone win any popularity contest? You got to vote. And the way that Google calculates votes is through links. So we're bringing it all together and back to the link. In Google's world, links that point from one site to another site serve as a vote. So if Google interprets a link from page A to page B as a vote, then Google is interpreting that link by page A for page B. More votes means more authority, which can mean better performance in the search results. Just how important are links to Google? Well. Google uses more than 200 ranking factors to determine search results. By some estimates, more than 90% of those ranking factors are related to backlinks. These are the 10 categories of, that Moz.com uses when it calculates its 200 ranking factors. You can see that half of them right on their face are directly related to links. The others have attenuated relation to links. Moz.com also, while we're on the subject, is a great resource. And here's a link to their 200 ranking factors. I recommend every single one of you go and read it. To recap, off-site SEO is a digital marketing strategy that targets higher search visibility by improving the authority of a website. Links are at the heart of the web and are important to SEO because these links act as votes. More votes means more authority. Link-related factors may account for more than 90% of search engine rankings. Next up, we're going to talk about links and how they impact search. Part two, links, what they do, why they matter. In this segment, we're going to talk about the anatomy of a link, what a backlink actually is, what we mean when we say backlink, what makes a good backlink or a good link in general. We're going to talk briefly about the link profile, authority metrics, uh, how Google and other third parties measure trust and how it moves around the web. And finally, we're going to talk about Google's quality guidelines. And as part of that discussion, we're definitely going to be talking about how to spot a bad link. 
So the anatomy of a link. So to really get into the guts of a link, of a hyperlink, you need to get into the source code. So source code is a listing of commands to be compiled or assembled into an executable computer program. So yeah, you know, we all know about source code. We've seen it in the movies. Um, you know, quick photo montage of a hacker like typing away at a keyboard and enhancing. Uh, you know, it's really fast paced. Um, and then there's a lot of hard techno in the background. Like that, basically. Neo Morpheus source code. Unfortunately, no. This is source code, and it's rather dull. So this is what a hyperlink looks like in the source code. You're going to see the A and the closing A, which surround the actual code that makes up the link. So that is kind of the beginning point and the end point for what we're looking at when we try to determine what's inside, what's making up the link code. href is where the link is going to take you. That's the destination. So in this case, the link that we click on is going to take us to example.com. The attribute that specifies the destination of the link. And the anchor down at the end by the closing A there, that's the anchor text. And that's what you're going to see rendered on the web page. Okay, That's what you're going to click on to take you from one place on the web to another. Finally, the target equals blank as a little added bonus knowledge and a little bit of marketing expertise just for you. It opens the link in a new page or in a new tab for a browser. And why that's important is, is that when you're doing marketing, you never really want to send someone, a potential customer, away from your site when you could keep them on the site and potentially make a sale. So if you have to have a link that goes away from your site, you want it to open in a new tab or new browser window. So here's what a text link looks like in the code. Um, you know, here's an example page, uh, the 20 best sneaker blogs. Uh, down at the bottom there is a link to the number three blog, Sneaker Freaker, one of my personal favorites. And here's what it looks like in the code. You have the A and the closing A. There you see the href, sneakerfreaker.com is the destination URL. The anchor text, Sneaker Freaker, which you can see rendered on the page right next to the number three. And target equals blank, which is going to open that link in a new tab or window. So another way that we see links is when there's a link as an image. So here we have an example of a link as an image in the HTML code. You can see that a lot of the attributes are the same as a text link, except for where the anchor text would be, there is a little bit of a difference in the code. IMG is the HTML tag that's going to define images. The src equals URL is the location where the image is on the website where the browser is going to go get it from. Basically what that means is that if you clicked on that link, the image would appear. But it's when it's rendered on the website where we're going to see it, it'll actually be a link that you can click on. The alt equals anchor is alt text, and that should ideally describe the image. Google can't read images, and neither can blind people for that matter. So alt text helps to describe the image to both search engines and sensory impaired searchers. And if for some reason Google can't load the image, or rather the browser can't load the image, it will display the alt text instead. Alt text and anchor text are very important, and both will be on the final, so you've been warned. All right, so now let's look at the image link in the code. Here is, again, the 20 best sneaker blogs, number three, Sneaker Freaker. This image is actually just an image. It's not the actual home page of Sneaker Freaker. And here's what it looks like in the code. Now, there are a lot of styling elements uh, in this particular link um, that we're just going to kind of black out and ignore for now because they just kind of confuse the issue. So again, you can see the A in the bracket of A at the top and bottom there. But what we're interested in is this IMG tag right there that denotes that the link is going to be an image. And there's the SRC address where it's pulling the image from. And finally, there's the alt text, the 20 best sneaker blogs. Now, in reality, the 20 best sneaker blogs doesn't really describe the image, but it is probably an automated script, so it's just pulling in the blog name. If we wanted to do a best practice alt text, it would say something like sneaker freaker number three of the 20 best sneaker blogs. Maybe a little bit shorter, I don't know. Now that we've kind of gotten into what a link is, what it looks like in the code, let's talk about backlinks, how links impact search. So what is a backlink exactly? Well, here's backlink defined. An incoming hyperlink 
from one web page to another web page. Pretty simple, right? This sort of kind of goes right back to the definition of a link. It's simply a way to get from one place on the internet to another. Here's the evolution of links in search. Early search, remember that hyperlinks were used for navigation only. In middle search, hyperlinks were used to quantify authority. And a lot of that went into being quantity over quality. The more links you have, the better off you were. In modern search, it's all about quality. You want as many quality links as possible, and that, in fact, outweighs quantity. So if you have two great backlinks and 250,000 poor backlinks, you want the two better backlinks, the 250,000 don't matter. That's Charles Darwin, he knows. And in addition, you want to get those backlinks by producing great content, and then people will just organically link back to you. And that's link building, which we talk about in part three. So what makes a good backlink? Well, the mantra that we kind of want to repeat here is not all links are created equal, right? Quality over quantity in modern search. So we want high quality backlinks. But what exactly makes up a high quality backlink? Authority, relevance, uniqueness, diversity, and traffic. Those are the big five categories of things that we look for in a quality backlink. So number one, authority. You want the site that's linking to you to be as authoritative and trusted as possible. You want it from a referring domain with high authority. You want the linking page and the site to rank well in Google. You want the linking domain to have a lot of referring domains of its own. So when we say referring domain, that simply means a site where there's a link pointing to another site. So referring domains to site A um, all have a backlink to site A on them. In turn, site A wants those sites to have a lot of backlinks to them. Here's an example. This gentleman is a young basketball player from Akron, Ohio. And I recently broke a story which says that he is actually moving back to Cleveland, Ohio to play basketball for his hometown team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. This was a huge story. It was everybody was all over it. All of the media outlets wanted a piece. ESPN. They quoted me, they linked back to my site. ESPN is a massive authority in its space. It was a great backlink for me. I was really happy. Since it is such a big story, ESPN wasn't the only outlet to pick up my incredible blog piece, this great piece of reporting, this exclusive information. I also got links from places like baconsports.com, which has relatively paltry authority. In this case, while ESPN is obviously the superior backlink, baconsports.com, I'll keep it because, as we're gonna talk about now, relevance. Relevance and context are important for backlinks because a link from a site or page with related subject matter is deemed to be more natural than a link from somewhere that is unrelated. So, for example, if I am selling basketball shoes, and I get a link from a site that sells French Bulldog puppies, that is not going to be what we would call contextually relevant. Uh, and it would be a lower quality backlink than from a site like Foot Locker. Also, it's good to know that anchor text should fit contextually with surrounding content. So if you have a link in a blog post, you wanna make sure that that anchor text fits directly into that sentence seamlessly. So let's have another example with my buddy from Akron. I got that great link from ESPN. When we talk about relevance and context, it doesn't get any more relevant than ESPN for a story about basketball, right? Green check mark, great stuff. I also, though, get a link from CNN. Now, CNN is more a general news outlet, but the story that I've broken is big. It's so big that it's transcended sports. This isn't like a box score for a Yankees game. This is big news. So this also, given the authority that CNN has, is a great backlink, green check mark. And now, because this story has gotten so big, it's gone viral and it's all mine, I'm getting links from places that don't make any sense. Like Baywork, which is a waste and wastewater treatment worker company. I don't even know what that means, but I do know that it has nothing to do with my basketball story. That is not a relevant or contextual link, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a terrible link 
Maybe it's somehow talking about basketballs found in wastewater. We don't really know. What you do know is that if it's a reputable company and it's not a spam website and all of the other factors that we're talking about are there, you can keep the link. But for the purposes of our example, ESPN and CNN are the links that we really want. So a quick word on anchor text. Anchor text is what Google and searchers use to determine what is on the other end of a hyperlink. But as an added bonus, Google also uses anchor text as a ranking factor, which means if you add keywords to your anchor text, and that keyword is also on the page you want to link to, you're gonna get some added benefit in the search results. So it is actually a very good technique for optimization when you follow a few simple rules. You want diversity in your anchor text. Don't use the same words over and over again. You want your link and your anchors to fit contextually in the content where they live. If it's in a blog post, again, it should fit seamlessly into a sentence. And finally, if you follow those two, number three should be easy. It should provide value for the user. So the general rule, write anchor text for users, not search engines. We can get into a little bit of trouble with anchor text in a couple of the following scenarios. If you over-optimize your anchor text, that is, if you use too many keywords, if it's too long, anything like that, you can run into trouble and get penalized for the link, or the link will just lose all its value, one of the two. Here we have an about author section in which uh, the author likes to tell us how much he likes writing about SEO, and in particular, um, fashion, tech, and mobiles. He then also talks about how he likes to write about the best laptop brands, which is a link that links out to a spam site about laptops in the market and helps select from top 10 laptop companies, also a link to same spam blog. This is over optimization and really would be pushing the limits of what we would call um, you know, tolerable anchor text. And the second example is a lack of contextual similarity between the anchor text and the content around it. So here we have a little bit of a paragraph about um, keyword positioning as a KPI, and bam, right in the middle, click here for payday loans. It's a link that has nothing to do with the surrounding content and is most definitely spam, and possibly hacked in there. So back to looking at what makes a quality backlink Let's get on again to diversity. Um, only this time we're gonna talk about diversity in terms of having a good ratio of backlinks to referring domains. And remember, a referring domain is any other site that has a link that points to yours. So here we have mysite.com. Uh, it's a really original and creative example that I came up with. I am in fact the creative spark of this company. Um, they would dwindle and die without me. And my competitor who has the equally clever name of competitor.com. We both have 200,000 backlinks. 200,000 is a lot. How many referring domains, though, is the question. I have 10,000 referring domains for a 20 to 1 link to domain ratio. My competitor has seven. Seven referring domains for a ratio of something like 25,800 to 1. So clearly, I get the green check mark. The lesson here is that Google wants to see that you're an authority, right? They want to see that you have a lot of different people who think that your site provides value to users, not just a few sites. Next up is talking about uniqueness. And uniqueness is a big deal to Google because it indicates that your site stands out. What we want to see here in terms of a quality backlink would be a link from a site or page that doesn't link to all your competitors, right? And again, differentiating yourself from your competitors is important to Google. So here's the example again of mysite.com. It's linked to by two equally authoritative sites, A and B. The problem is, is that site A, is all my competitors are milling around site A because site A gives out backlinks pretty easily. Site B, on the other hand, is an informational site. It links out generally to other informational sites only. The fact that it linked to my site indicates that I have higher quality content and I am a trusted source. So in this example, authority B gets the green check mark. Now, I want to make it clear that there's nothing wrong with a relevant contextual link from authority A. Just for the purposes of uniqueness, authority B is the better link. Finally, let's talk about traffic. So 
Just like we discussed, a backlink is for search. It's a search vernacular term, right? It's an industry term. But links themselves are just really all about navigating, right? So a search engine authority should be a bonus that attaches to a backlink. Placing a link should be for the user. And what that means is that you should really strive to have content and a link that a user find useful. You want the user, you want to generate traffic organically through the link just as much as you want to generate authority in the search engines. Here are some other important factors when it comes to determining the quality of a backlink. Links that are higher up on the page pass more authority than links further down the page. Pages with fewer links pass more authority than pages with more links. If you have fewer links on a page, it's going to be better for you in terms of backlink authority than if there were many links on the page. And links in the content are also better than links in static elements. When we talk about static elements, what we're referring to is the standard header, sidebar, and footer that we see on a lot of websites that have templates. And finally, we don't want links to be paid for, sponsored, or reciprocal. The real question now is, what do we do with links that are not high quality? So getting rid of dubious links, you have two general options. Option one, delete the link. That's a great solution, but the problem is, is that a lot of times you don't have control over a lot of these sites where your links live. So if you want to do outreach, you can try and have the webmaster delete the link, but it's probably going to be pretty difficult. Option two, you can tell Google the link shouldn't pass authority, and you can do that in two ways, through the disavow tool or through the rel no follow attribute in the HTML code for a link. The rel no follow HTML tag, it tells the Google bot not to follow the link. Now let's do a quick recap, a quick review. There are three parts of the search engine. There's the crawler, there's the index, and there's the search engine itself. The crawler is what Google bot is, and that Take, crawls the HTML and feeds it into the index. The search engine then applies filters and decides if your page is good enough to be considered uh, as a response to a query by a searcher. So in terms of links, what this means is that if Googlebot doesn't follow the link, it's not going to be recorded as a followed link in the index, and in no authority is going to be passed. It's not going to be reported to the search engine as a followed link. So if no authority gets passed, the link really can't be said to manipulate search, which kind of gets you in the clear. But at the same time, it can still act as a simple navigational tool from one site to another. So this is a great example of when to use a rel no follow tag. This is a tweet from Search Engine Land. I recommend you all follow Search Engine Land. They got great stuff over there. But this is a tweet, and tweets are user-generated content. Now, if this tweet passed authority, of which we have to assume Twitter probably has quite a lot, every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there would be on Twitter spamming 140 characters worth of links trying to build their authority with spam. So this is an ideal situation for rel no follow, and here we see it in the code. You can see the typical link elements, there's the A bracketed in there, and there is rel no follow right in the middle which tells Google the link doesn't pass authority. So the only benefit that we would get is that somebody follows us on Twitter and clicks through organically. Here are some other times when using rel no follow is good. Other user generated content aside from social media like a blog or forum posts, links in static elements which we just talked about, the header, the footer, and the sidebars, any links you have paid for. Rel no follow is bad whenever the link could actually provide you with authority it's a legitimate endorsement of your site or your content, and it could provide value to users. One little caveat here is that kind of just like getting a link deleted, you got to ask for the tag to be uh, applied on a site. But generally, a webmaster would probably be more disposed to adding rel no follow than completely erasing a link. So I want to talk quickly also about the link profile. A link profile is simply an aggregation of all the backlinks that are pointing to a site. And in general, good links mean a good link profile, and what makes good links also makes a pro link profile good. Uh, Neil Patel here, founder of Kissmetrics and Crazy Egg, has a quote about how you know, the link profile accounts for the vast majority of a site's ranking. Next up, we're gonna talk about authority metrics and how that trust that we've built up through links moves around the web. We're gonna start with the granddaddy of them all. What is Google PageRank? Google PageRank 
is the original method and now is just one of those 200 ranking factors that Google used to determine a page's relevance or importance. So higher page rank can lead to higher search visibility. It doesn't automatically mean that you're going to get higher search visibility. It's measured from 1 to 10 and it's based on backlinks. And right there is the formula for page rank. And if any of you can tweet me in 140 characters exactly what that equation means, you'll get some extra credit. All right, so what does PageRank do exactly? This is Rand Fishkin. This is Moz's creator. Um, he's obviously a wizard with his cauldron and fire. Um, and he's a gr another great resource to follow. So links on the web can be interpreted as votes. We already know that. But while all votes are initially considered equal, once Google runs the algorithm, pages that receive more votes become more important. And then they, in turn, cast votes that are more important as the algorithm continues to run. So PageRank has become a little more obsolete over the years. So we're going to quickly talk about two third-party metrics that have become a little bit more important in recent times. Domain authority, which was Moz's proprietary measure of search engine ranking prediction, calculates based on Moz's other link metrics. And those include linking domains, total number of links, and I only bring that up because right there you see the ratio that we were talking about in regards to referring domains to backlinks. The other important uh, trust link that I use is Trustflow from Majestic SEO. Uh, Majestic SEO has kind of a seed bin of trusted sites. And if those trusted sites, a number of them link to another site, that site gets a higher rank for Trustflow. That's a very simple way of talking about how the metric works. But basically the point to understand is that trustworthy sites are seen to link to other trustworthy sites. So that's kind of how that works. So how does this authority move through the web? Well, this is an analogy that is kind of popular. Um, it's, we call it link juice. So here's a definition from Boris de Maria uh, talking about how link juice is a colloquial term in the SEO world that refers to the power or equity passed to a site via links. So this is a really interesting diagram which kind of talks about how authority is distributed on the web. And we have basically, you have 11 balloons of various sizes and colors, it must be said. The numbers add up to 99.9, .9, but for the sake of this demo, let's just call it 100. This is a visualization of the internet if, it, if the internet were made up of 11 sites and the black arrows constitute all the backlinks in existence. What you should understand is that prior to running the authority algorithm, in this case PageRank, all of these balloons were originally the same size. Now after running the algorithm, links were weighted according to which were the most authoritative. This increased or decreased the relative size of each balloon. So notice how much more authority the reciprocal link between B and C have. B has inbound authority either directly or indirectly from eight sites it doesn't link back to. It has only one outbound link to C, and C only links back to B. This is the environment where we kind of see how links can be a little bit detrimental in terms of providing quality search results but it's also a great way to understand page rank and how authority moves around the web. So some quick caveats, internal versus external links. So internal links also pass page rank. They also distribute authority throughout the site, but they're not going to be as influential in search rankings as external links. And the reasoning should be relatively obvious. Uh, a self vote shouldn't count as much as a third party vote when we're talking about a popularity contest. The second little caveat that I wanted to bring up is that we should think of authority less like juice and perhaps more like a candle. Using juice as an analogy kind of makes it seem like uh, you could pour out all of your link authority um, and have none left. When in reality it's more like lighting a candle. You have a big old candle and you're able to light a lot of smaller candles without losing any of your flame. A quick review of that segment, PageRank, Google's algorithm for measuring a site's authority based on the number and quality of backlinks that site receives, which it has in recent times been supplanted by third-party metrics like domain authority and trust flow. 
It's also good to know that link juice is the industry term for describing how page rank flows through links, both internal and external, and transfers authority. So now that we've got a pretty good understanding of what links are, how they pass authority, and how that authority moves around the web, it's time to get into a little bit more uh, science about how Google treats different types of links. Google has what's called the quality guidelines. The basics are pretty simple. You can follow them at the link at the bottom of this slide, but basically make pages primarily for users, not search engines. Don't deceive your users. Don't try to trick search engines into getting better rankings. Ask yourself, does this help my users? And finally, what we talked about a little bit before, just make your website stand out. I recommend you follow the link to the Webmaster Guidelines at the bottom of the slide here. We really don't have time to go through all of them, but it's really important that you understand how it works. So one of the key things that the Google Guidelines touch on are link schemes. Link schemes include things like buying or selling links that pass page rank. Remember we said that any links that you purchase should be rel no followed and they should be in a place where they're going to drive organic traffic, traffic through the link. Excessive link exchanges. One or two link exchanges with sites in your niche, your business area, that's okay. But when it gets to be a large scale operation and someone may or may not be making money off these link exchanges, that's going to raise a little bit of a specter of manipulation and you're going to want to be really careful or Google's going to put the smack down. Large scale article marketing or guest posting campaigns with keyword rich anchor text. Article marketing and guest posting are great digital marketing tactics that have been turned to the dark side and used uh, spammily to kind of generate backlinks that aren't deserved for content that's not that great. If you have something that provides value to the user and you have something to say as a well-positioned expert in your niche, it's fine to do article marketing and guest posting. Automated programs or services, that just raises the specter of the links being unnatural or the link development being unnatural. And remember that Google really wants to just see a site that's doing great and is generating authority of its own accord because it's producing great content. Finally, large-scale link networks like blog rolls or link wheels, that stuff is a big no-no. Although, one caveat there, it can be exceptionally effective at climbing the rankings quickly. One last caveat about the Google guidelines. You need to understand that violating the Google guidelines is not breaking the law. Manipulative linking and violation of the guidelines, it can work. It can boost you up the rankings overnight and you can do really well for a little bit of time. What's going to happen is you're going to get caught and you're probably going to get the site de-indexed. When could this possibly be a good thing? Well, that kind of depends on your client. If your client is a well-established brand who's been around for 40 years and has a website that's been around since 1997, and he comes to you and he says, son, I need you to do some SEO for me. I need you to help me climb the rankings. Business isn't going so well. We need to get to page one. Now, this puts you in a little bit of a quandary because he may be expecting things that you can't accomplish if you're going to do things the Google way. Now, if you do things the Google way, it might cost more time, spend way more money, and just generally be a bigger pain in the behind than it would if you use black hat tactics. But you're doing it the way that Google wants and the site's not going to get damaged. If you do it the black hat way, he might jump to number one overnight, but what are you going to say to him when you get the site de-indexed, delisted from Google, and you ruin his good name on the internet? These are the things that you have to consider as an SEO. Handling the accounts, account management, and dealing with clients is a really important aspect of the job that we do. So this leads to some ominous musical foreshadowing. If you're going to violate the Google guidelines, you might run into a giant penguin who is trying to eat the United States Capitol. And here is an overall segment review. One, know how to spot a link in the source code. Good links have authority, they're relevant, they're diverse, and they're in places that will drive traffic to your site through them. Remember that authority should be a bonus. We really want people to click through the links, so we want them in places where they're seen. 
Authority is measured by Google and third parties differently. Uh, understand how authority and trust move through the web. And one key takeaway from the Google guidelines is gonna be optimize for people, not search engines. And finally, violating the Google guidelines is not a crime. So this is a good segue into part three of this presentation, which is gonna be on link building. Strategies for improving authority by actively cultivating backlinks. When we talk about link building today, we're gonna to go through some definitions. We're gonna talk about link building best practices and tactics, and other link building, non-best practices and tactics. And we're also gonna discuss how these are considered in our industry terms to be white hat, black hat, and gray hat. So, what is link building? According to Larry Kim at WordStream, link building is the process of getting external pages to link to a page on your website. It is one of the many tactics used in search engine optimization. So let's talk about link building best practices and tactics. Link building is the cornerstone of offsite SEO, and I would actually argue that link building is the cornerstone of all SEO. You cannot have a site that ranks, you cannot have proper search visibility without having a link building program that's gonna build high quality links and that stays on the right side of the Google quality guidelines. In industry vernacular, we call link building like this white hat. So now we're gonna look at some tactics that you can use in your own link building strategy to produce high quality backlinks that build authority for your site over time. Content marketing. So the strategy here is to produce great content, Get that content out to the masses, have it disseminated, and get backlinks for it. P sounds pretty easy, right? In reality, this is really, really hard. It takes time, money, and energy just to get any sort of content marketing campaign going. Some examples include blogs, articles, infographics, uh, videos, podcasts, uh, gong shows, you name it. If it's content made for the web, it qualifies under content marketing. So we have this great piece of content now and we need to publicize it. That's the next step. If you produce great content and nobody ever reads it or sees it, how are they gonna know it's great? You need to get out there and do marketing with your content and get it out in the public eye. And great ways to do that include social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever's next, pay-per-click campaigns, email outreach, and syndication. You also need to become an authority in your niche and develop an audience. Once you do that, your audience is gonna keep coming back every time you produce content. They're also gonna share it with their audience. And in that way, you're organically growing the reach of your content, and over time, that's gonna pay dividends in terms of SEO authority. If you're looking for a resource on content marketing, look no further than copyblogger.com, period. Brian Clark is a great advocate and a great expert and really the guru of content marketing in 2014. Another great way to build backlinks is through doing interviews. Interviews are one of the best ways to earn editorial links from high quality sources, according to Wizard Supreme Rand Fishkin at Moz. Good interviewees can include influencers in your niche, thought leaders, who have perspective on your niche. So they might not even be involved in the business that you're in, but they understand certain aspects of it, like leadership or salesmanship, and have perhaps a unique way to present new ideas to your audience in your niche. And also, good interviewees include experts on a topic. Obviously, you want people who know your business and know what they're talking about. Infographics are a great way to earn backlinks in 2014. An infographic is a visual image, such as a chart or design, used to represent information or data. What you need to do here is create an awesome infographic, just like content marketing, super easy, right? Just pull information out of the air and boom, out comes an infographic. In reality, it's very difficult. You need to have great designers, great creatives, and great developers in order to produce an infographic that really captures the imagination. But once you do have that infographic, you wanna reach out to businesses and other parties that may be interested in hosting the infographic on their site and showing it to their audience again. Offer to write a custom intro, include a little backlink in there, and bam, you've built a link and you've provided value to another site owner. So they might come back and see if they can get more from you later on. 
This is a great example of an infographic. It's the periodic table of SEO success factors. This is produced by Search Engine Land, who again, you have to follow on Twitter. It's really great information. I have a copy printed up and sitting on my desk all the time, and I put a link to it down there at the bottom. I recommend everyone go download it and take a look and kind of keep it close. They update it every year. This is the 2014 version. So the next link building tactic Guest blogging and the expert credential is what we're going to talk about here. Guest blogging is pretty self-explanatory, I think. You write a post positioned as an expert or somebody who knows something about a certain niche on another authoritative blog. And by doing so, you get a link back to your site in your author bio or actually even in the content of your post. You also build up an expert credential in your niche. People start to view you as somebody who knows what's going on who is an expert in the field and who can be looked at as an influencer perhaps in the future. One caveat to this is that the tactic has been really abused and penalized by spammers. People will post very low quality blog posts, add a link back to their site, and this is a way to manipulate search engine rankings. So there are a lot of guest blog networks that have been hurt pretty badly by Google lately. But if you're doing it the right way, if you're providing value for the user and positioning yourself as an expert in the field, there's nothing wrong with guest posting. In addition, when you've created enough of an expert aura around yourself, that credential can lead to interviews. Obviously, whenever you're interviewed, you're going to get a backlink. Some other white hat tactics to consider include .gov and .edu link building. So these domain extensions are more trusted than others. And whether that's organic or if Google has kind of some built-in preference for them, we don't really know. What we do know is that when you get backlinks from them, they're definitely going to be quality. So the .gov domains are pretty tough nut to crack. But .edu, there are a lot of opportunities to get links. For example, a student directory or an alumni directory for your alma mater. If your client or your, you uh, contribute in some way to sports programs, arts programs, uh, if you donate time or money, maybe you can get a link that way. Getting backlinks from .edu is never a bad idea. It's always going to be high quality and there, again, like I said, tons of opportunity. Another tactic is broken link building. And this is a little bit more technical. We're going to use our SEO internet tools to go out there and look for broken links on sites that link to other competitors in our business niche. So you go to, a, you sell widgets and you go to widgets.com and see that they've got a link to another widget site, but that link is broken. You contact the webmaster and tell them, hey, I discovered a broken link on your site. How about you put my site in there instead of the one you've got? You help a site owner fix a broken link, which is a problem for him and you get a backlink out of the bargain, everybody wins. Link reclamation happens when you fix broken links either on your site, which increases the page rank that flows between internal links, and also by finding broken links to your site from external sources. And you can then go in and redirect pages or fix the links so that you are regenerating some of that authority that you lost when the original link broke. Finally, good karma linking. If you sponsor charities, engage in philanthropy, not only are you potentially positioning yourself to get a link from those sites, but every local news outlet loves a good, feel-good human interest story, and you might just get a link back that way as well. On the other side of the coin from White Hat is Black Hat link building. Black Hat involves using explicitly disapproved techniques to improve search visibility. When you ask yourself, is the work that I'm doing adding value to the user, or am I just doing this for search engines to see? And the answer is, I'm just doing this for search engines. You're doing black hat link building. The problem is, is that black hat works, but not for long. Consequences of getting caught for black hat include getting pages and sites de-indexed from Google. Depending on your business, that could pretty much spell the end of your online marketing presence. Some specific examples of black hat link building include link manipulation. A big one here is just buying links. Uh, there's been, and there are still emails that circulate in this industry that offer 50,000 links for $50 or something like that. Well, that's great, 
but if they're not quality backlinks as we previously discussed, Google search engines and the other search engines are so, so sophisticated at this point that those links won't provide any value and could potentially end up resulting in penalties if they are found to be in violation of the webmaster and quality guidelines. Other examples of black hat link building include link schemes, such as link networks, link farms, and link wheels. This is a link farm, and it's basically a site that builds PageRank and links out to pretty much anyone. A lot of times these sites have artificially built up authority on their own, so they might be PageRank 5 or PageRank 6, and then they start to just add links that apportion out their PageRank and their link juice. And the problem here is that once you start paying for links, this is that slippery slope where you get into link manipulation and Google penalties. And also, I mean, if you look at all the links on the page in this example, it's got to be pretty tough to get yourself extricated from that mess once you're in. Just like link farms, link networks start out as low quality sites that artificially build up authority. They link together and then they'll bring in other sites to kind of artificially increase their authority. These are usually organized, built, and maintained by one party, either a marketing firm or just a rogue SEO out there on his own. And a link network ignores quality in favor of generating vast quantities of artificial links on a large number of websites that they, the one party or rogue SEO, controls. Now, I want you to again look here at the last emphasized point, they control. You do not control these links. Therefore, if you purchase a link on a link network and it goes out to every site on a link network, wow, you're gonna have a serious problem when it comes to link cleanup. You have to track down all of these links and then try and get the webmaster to either delete them or add rel no follow. It's a real pain. You're better off not getting involved in this at all. This is kind of my favorite example of Black Hat, just because it's so ingenious, really, and it's called a link wheel. So here we have our money site, your site, in the middle of those kind of, we'll call them Web 2.0 properties. Squidoo blogs, WordPress sites, Blogger blogs, uh, Weebly, Quizilla. And then you can see that linking into the Blogger blog, and those would all link into the WordPress, Squidoo, and other blogs as well, you have backlinks from Dig, mentions from Twitter, um, you know, other social bookmarking sites, all trying to artificially build up the authority of these Web 2.0 properties. These Web 2.0 properties then all link to each other and then link into the money site. If you do this right, you can climb the search rankings in absolutely no time. But if you do it right and then it goes wrong, you're gonna get banned for sure from the Google index. So again, use with care, know your client. Let's go back to the modern search is more sophisticated point. While modern search engines aren't perfect, AI isn't at 100%, we haven't reached the singularity yet, it is a lot better than it was. Here, for example, is a tweet from Matt Cutts, the head of the Google Web Spam team. He's quoting sales literature from a site that artificially produces backlinks. The tweet obviously says that their code and software which generates the links, or publishes the links as they say, isn't detectable by the search engine bots. Au contraire, says Cuts. This drives home the point that not everything marketers tell you is gonna be the truth, and there are a lot of people who play dirty out there. What used to work doesn't work anymore, and if it does work, it's not gonna work for long. Always bear that in mind. And with that sophistication, of course, come the several million shades of gray. Google's guidelines are not black and white. There's ample room to bend the rules before they break, and many, many people do. Again, the problem is that gray hat, just like black hat, works. There are consequences for getting caught, and you need to ask yourself what the client's goals are. Are you willing to trade long-term viability of your website for short-term gain? If you need to do any further reading on the darker side of link building and SEO in general, look no further than black hat world, if you can't find the answers there, I guarantee you there will be links to a blog that can answer your devious questions. To review, link building is the cornerstone of off-site SEO, and in my opinion, all SEO, and it takes many forms. You're gonna to wanna to stay on top of the best ways to get links from the most authoritative sources. You're gonna to wanna to use the white hat techniques and tactics 
to organically generate backlinks and provide value to users. If you're short on time and you're short on money, you can try going black hat, which are tactics that are explicitly forbidden by the Google quality guidelines, or gray hat which are practices that may result in a site being filtered or penalized by Google's algorithms. Speaking of penalties, let's move on to part four of the lecture. All right, in part four, we're gonna cover penalties, link analysis, and recovery. So we're gonna talk about algorithmic and manual penalties in search engines. Then we're gonna talk about recovering from those penalties. And finally, we'll do a brief introduction to link analysis. Just to review, modern search, remember, is all about the user and having quality that is gonna provide value to them. Google has developed algorithms that filter or penalize pages that use manipulative practice to gain search engine ranking. And if you don't provide value to the user, you're definitely gonna get pinched for that. Penalties can be applied by algorithms, which happens automatically, or by people, which happens manually. So algorithmic penalties are done by math. They're filters that are appended to the search engine and they're automatic. You're gonna have a page maybe that has a few bad links to it, and Google is gonna take away the authority for a lot of those links, and your page is gonna drop drastically in the SERPs. That's not going to drag your whole site down, and if you remove the links, you might recover. But what you need to know is that's automatic. It's not somebody doing it on their own. What usually happens when a, that page gets penalized is that when you take uh, corrective action, it's gonna come back after that algorithm that penalized you is updated. So for some algorithms, the time periods for updates are shorter, uh, some are longer. Most link spam algorithms are around six months apart. And we know from kind of posts by the Google web spam team that really these are massive engineering efforts that, are, that go into updating these algorithms and that's why it takes so long. Manual penalties on the other hand are administered by people. And Google will automatically take action if a person that works for Google finds a website that is violating the quality webmaster guidelines. Punitive measures can include de-indexing of a page or de-indexing of a full site for a set period of time or an indefinite period of time. Penalties generally do have expirations, but the problem is if they expire and you haven't corrected the issue, you're just gonna slip right back into the penalty status. And you can get a link directly to the manual penalties information at the bottom of this slide. So one algorithm change that I wanted to talk about in particular is Penguin, which is also known as the web spam update. This algorithmic filter was rolled out in April, 2012, and it targeted web spam generally and link spam specifically. And remember that link spam is any of those manipulative linking practices, practices that produce unnatural links, which includes the black hat link building techniques that we just discussed. Penguin 2.0 rolled out in May of 2013, and that was geared towards more precisely targeting pages rather than entire sites. At the bottom here, you can see an analytics graph of what Penguin looks like. So on April 24th, the site was hit with Penguin. You can see that the traffic got cut down to almost nothing. And when there was a recovery, quote unquote recovery, on May 26th, the traffic did not go back to the pre-Penguin levels. When we talk about recovering from penalties, manual penalties are going to be a little bit easier because you're gonna get notified automatically in Google Webmaster Tools. There's a little tab that says Manual Actions. And if you click on it and it says that there's a penalty, it'll tell you what that penalty is and what you can do to fix it. Once you've kind of taken that corrective action, then you submit a reconsideration request, a direct line to Google, and you'll find out whether they're gonna lift the penalty or whether you need to take further steps. For algorithmic penalties, it's not that simple. You're gonna to need to use link analysis to determine the cause of the rankings or traffic drop and then take action based on that research. Wait patiently. So, what's the timetable on recovery? Well, there isn't one. Even with manual penalties, it can be a real crapshoot. You don't know um, exactly what they've found. Sometimes the Google team is not very prompt in their communication with you, and it can really kind of become a real pain. So the best advice, a little bit tongue in cheek, don't get penalized in the first place, huh? So when we talk about link analysis, I'm gonna do a quick intro, just because that's gonna be the focus of our tactical lecture. 
What we talk about when we talk about link analysis is keeping track of the links to your site. That's all the links in your link profile. What we want to do is we want to monitor almost continuously what's going on. That way there won't be any surprises. We can keep an eye on potential issues. We can track any changes, massive additions of links or a lot of links that get deleted, for example. And we can also eventually find new opportunities for linking by kind of keeping an eye on what industry experts are doing with their blogs and their sites. Finally, when we talk about link analysis, I really want to stress that you need to document everything. And we'll talk more about that in the tactical lecture as well. So to review, link-related algorithmic penalties are automatically applied. There's no notification, and it requires link analysis to diagnose and fix. As we've talked about, there's no timetable for recovery there. Link-related manual penalties result from a manual review of the site and reveal linking practices that have violated the Google guidelines. You're going to get a Webmaster Tools notification and also a direct line into Google to tell you what you need to do to lift the penalty and when that penalty has in fact been removed. And finally, like I said, there's no recovery timetable. It's just best not to get penalized in the first place by doing really good link analysis, not engaging in black hat, and generally being a good web citizen. We're almost there. We're almost to the end. Conclusion, key takeaways. So if you're going to take anything away from this, I want you to have kind of picked up on some key skills. Know how to spot a high quality link versus a low quality link. Remember authority, relevance, and diversity are the big three things that you want to look for. Know the Google guidelines, be able to recognize violations. Know what's natural, know what's unnatural, be able to kind of look at a link and say this is manipulative, this anchor text is unnatural, this is a sidebar link that's not no followed. Be able to identify those things and then you'll have a better reference point for how to proceed as an SEO. Building links is a necessary part of offsite SEO and it is the number one skill that offsite SEO requires. If you do it the right way, it's going to be hard, it's going to be time consuming, and it's going to be expensive. If you do it the wrong way, it can be quick and easy. Be able to speak intelligently about the pros and cons of each approach with your client, in addition to being able to actually carry out these independent strategies and tactics. And finally, we really want to be able to do quality link analysis in order to assess penalties and kind of aid in recovery. I also want you to understand that there are certain things that you can do that are always going to work when it comes to off-site SEO. Producing great content that people want to share and link to is always going to get you results, but they might not be as quick as you want or as cheap as you want. In addition, you got to work hard to spread the word about that content through outreach. Social networks like Twitter, Facebook, and you know, again, whatever comes next, you know, posting blog comments post on forums, direct email, position yourself as an expert and get the word out about the stuff that you're producing and how great it is. You also want to patrol your territory, police your grounds, know what's happening on site and off site. You will be the better for it, your clients will be the better for it. And finally, be educated about what's going on right now in SEO. The game changes every single day, sometimes twice a day. If you don't keep up, you're gonna get left behind. So that about does it for me. I want to thank you all for joining me today. And I hope that this is a useful tool for you to better understand off-site SEO, how to build links, and to become better digital marketers. Thank you.